All right, so just a quick recap uh, after part three there. Um, we started hearing the healing aspect, the healing journey of what Annika went through after the incredible story that she shared in part one and part two. And uh, we're gonna continue that journey here in part four. And afterwards, we're going to get into a little bit of the takeaway, some of the deeper aspects of why we felt this interview was just so important. So enjoy part four and we'll catch you at the end. So one question with regards to your personal journey which we're talking about in your, your healing in particular. How does one deal with having to take someone's life? And how do you heal from that? Right. I'm not sure if I'll ever heal completely from it. I, I did um, carry this burden, though, very, very strongly for most of my life. And that was the purpose for me to carry that because I couldn't speak out, for example, the strongest reason, one of the strongest reasons why was not so much because I would be killed, but it was because I thought that I would be called out as a perpetrator because I felt that I was. Because I, at 11 years old, I was given the choice and I had taken a life. So I had obviously worked in therapy. Um, I had heard some good people tell me that um, I was a victim too. And I didn't believe it. I wanted to believe them, but I didn't believe it. So it wasn't until um, 2013, writing, writing about the experience again, and suddenly, I suddenly put it together. There were certain little things that were missing from the memory. And in particular, what I remembered is what I had always done in the network. And I always thought about the way to do the action that I was made to do, that I knew I wasn't a choice and was made to do it in the way that would cause the least harm. And then in this situation, that least harm meant that I should kill her. And I realized that it wasn't the guilt. I had a guilt complex. I lived with this uh, vast guilt complex that everything that I ever did or said, I always went back and thought I must have done something wrong in it. So it's not introspection, it's a guilt complex, just constantly going back over every little interaction. I couldn't really function very well because I was always, you know, any, you know, somebody wouldn't call back and I would worry that I'd done something to upset them, you know, and I would maybe even ask them and they'd maybe say, no, not at all, you know, it has nothing to do with you, basically. Yeah. But um, that just hung over my life like a, like a cloud for most of, so 13, I was, um, well, I was, it was right before, I was 49, it was right before my 50th birthday. So from 11 to 49, I held, the, I had this tremendous guilt complex. And then when I, when I understood, fully understood, that so I had to ins I had to internally believe it, you know. So once that sure. happened, it was the birth I call it the birth of self esteem. Okay. When I knew that it's not my fault. But to take a life, I did that anyway. You know, that's uh, I went through that action of yeah. taking that life. I think of this girl every day. Yeah. You know, I know what she looked like. I um, I haven't f felt anything or anything, but I think of her every day, and I am thinking of small ways, rituals, to honor the children that were killed in the network, the ones that I saw and ones that I didn't see. And what what of your experience? let's say your spiritual experience of having 
heard some confirmation that she is safe at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That's a different realm. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, I, in that moment, I, I, I wanted to know, I heard that then. So it's, the spiritual, in that sense, it's separate as long as we're in the body and working out. Um, you just have to work that psychology and yeah. go back and, um, and, um, and really know it to, by feeling it. Right. So I don't feel guilty today about it. I actually feel that because of that experience, I understand killers. I understand how they would become addicted to that moment. Right. I understand it. And I understand the projection. I understand the... the, the so this girl, when I struck, she wasn't that girl at all. So in the biggest sense, you have to dissociate and you have to project onto the victim in order to do what you do. So that had been done to me, but now I was doing it, and so she wasn't that girl at all. She was my mother, and then she was me mm -hmm. at the essence of it. it was, I was killing myself. And that insanity is necessary to kill whether it's a person or whether it's an animal, usually. Mm. To take a life, mm. you have to dissociate. You have to get away you know, from your feelings of empathy. Right. Um, you have to get in hunter mode, which is the, 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 the system kind of, hunter-prey mode. Yeah. And in the smallest sense, um, judgment, victim identification, how I was in the place of the victim and I was really inhabiting that space of my victimization. And it's this victim identification that is the first prerequisite to cause harm. That you, the moment you think you're the victim, you're actually setting up to harm someone else because it, it uh, re removes all responsibility from you right. and you have no accountability at that moment. And so in the smallest sense it happens through judgment. You know, and I'm not talking like I'm above all of this, by the way, you know, I'm experiencing this all the time, but I'm always looking at it in the smallest sense, judgment. There's a judgment, I have to, well, judgment is maybe too different. Um, but the moment somebody does something to me, in, uh, like driving on the road, and I feel like they're victimizing me, well, I used to just feel like a victim and be angry, you know, for getting cut off or whatever, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and now, well, I, I dealt with that problem <laughs> somewhat. I'm not such an angry driver anymore. But what I realize is if I get, if I feel like a victim, I just start to think, oh, there must be some young part in me yeah. that is actually trying to express something. Now you're, you're, you have healing triggers yes. when something happens yeah. and it, it snaps you into consciousness rather than snapping you into unconsciousness. Nice, nice way to put it. Yeah. yeah. To bring the healing consciousness to the trigger rather. You know, the trigger is there and then a little bit later comes, oh, but... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's a very satisfying way to start to deal with those things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes. Right. Yes. And, and self-esteem really is necessary for introspection. So it's tricky because if you don't have the self-esteem, um, you, you know, you, you're just going to either beat yourself up um, you know, it's not really doable without self-esteem, so it's, it's tricky. It's always tricky. Right. And we're living in a world where our fellow human beings and ourselves are always in need of feeling better about ourselves. And so if we can be aware of that,
just be aware of how powerful it is when you judge someone and how powerful it is when you make someone feel like they're okay the way they are and they're perfect mm -hmm. the way they are how powerful that is you know and yes. that's one of the things that we can any day any time with any person we can just activate that absolutely and feel like we're part of this great thing that's happening yes yeah to listen and then also reflect you listen to me and then you also reflect so that I know that you actually understand what I'm talking about even though I also feel that you understand me because you're already open you know there's a, an, an, an energy of vibration now tell me about this group that you've started and how you're kind of in a very special and very specific way bringing this critical awareness to to some people Yes, so I've been in uh, uh, support groups for a long time for sexual abuse, but then um, satanic ritual abuse is very specific. And I started to meet in the group for sexual abuse, started to meet survivors of satanic ritual abuse. And as I was, um, well, I came to the group with a, a lot of years under my belt, and then I came... I had a lot of help from the support group as well. And then, uh, so I started to work with survivors of satanic ritual abuse. And then after my video went viral, people reached out to me from all over the world. So that resulted finally in now a WhatsApp group that I, that I moderate, that I run for survivors of satanic ritual abuse. So this, um, this has been an, an, an incredible experience because I always thought that there were no other people, that there would be no other people alive. But then uh, as I was saying before, we were pitted against each other and it, we were not really, we couldn't really befriend anyone because we couldn't openly befriend anyone because that got punished or if we try to protect someone we got punished for it yeah. uh, so so now I find that this group not only um, the, the things that are described are as horrific as some of the things that you heard and, and worse um, you know there's certain things that I I had a relatively short time in the network right. compared to others. Um, I never got pregnant. I was too young. I was out before I could get pregnant. Right. And even in, you know, I haven't of course told you everything, but I went through some horrific, horrific things. Well, there are people who've gone through things that, you know, are different and, you know, so things that you could never dream of. And yet, the vibration of the group, there is this incredible sweetness, first of all, um, incredible strength. And for each person, it's, I think it's the first one, I don't, there are uh, groups of survivors of satanic ritual abuse, but not the specific support format, but mm -hmm. I know that I know. There are, there is actually, in fact, a conference. Um, but you always have to worry when something is very public, how it gets infiltrated and yeah. um, uh, how safe it then is at the end of the day. So um, I moderate and there's definitely safety guidelines. And so people share, get to share, and then get this uh, experience reflected by someone who's been through it. So when people were telling me that it was not my fault because I was made to kill, and they were telling me, no, it was not your fault, well, I didn't believe them. Right. But when I say it to someone who's been through it as a child, and they were made to kill, and they're carrying that, well, I know I've been through it, and I can tell them it was not their fault, and I can go into the specifics, and they can really believe it. Yeah. And to have our experiences, first of all, it tells me the mo most everyone is younger than me. So 
where are the, uh, the new generations. So I can tell you that the people currently in power are just as involved in these extremely dark actions as were the people from my generation that, you know, were uh, ruling in the 70s, 80s, world rulers, white men though, um, only, uh, and certain white women. I, I'm sure that it happens in other cultures, but not, uh, I never came across anyone from other cultures. Um, and the tactics employed are what we've been through and the specific tortures that we endured that you would never think anyone could think up seems to be just right out of a handbook. It's quite, really quite amazing. We've all been through the same things. And for all of us, we're finding this reflection on this big, big level for the first time. And there's no one telling us what to do because we're all, we've all been through it. And the healing from that, I think, is exponential. Like we heal, we, we, I've learned, I've healed. Sometimes I realize it, things fall into place for me. I understand things from the network perspective um, that I didn't understand before or the reason for why a certain torture was done. And um, it's beautiful. And I'm, I'm going to do the same, I'm going to do, so this is my, this is what I, most precious to me right now. Right. And um, what is the most amazing thing to me is that everyone there, there is this, understand, it's like we get to now be the children that we wanted to be. Mm. We get to help each other, mm. and we get to support each other, and mm. we, got to, we get to tell each other that we've always been on each other's side. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's so beautiful. So beautiful. I was going to say that, you know, having had the courage to go through your healing journey and having that giving its own satisfaction, now additionally you're bringing to these other people your experience, your empathy, your compassion, and well, they're, they're bringing, bringing it, it to too, me. Right? Yeah. They're yeah. All, they're, but yeah. So you're, it's a shared sort of journey yeah. where you're. Your courage, each person's courage is, is being rewarded here. And it's, it's almost like, must be like feeling like you're home. It's like this is Completely. where... Completely. <laughs> you know, yeah. That Very much be. home. And then somebody posted a picture the other day. Oh, it's so funny. Of a unicorn looking at an article uh, that says that unicorns don't exist. No. And here's the proof. <laughs> <laughs> oh... That's how we feel. That's something. So that's done online. It's yeah. on, on the phones, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, is is that a? I don't know WhatsApp. I know WhatsApp, but I, that's a <laughs> messaging, and it's it's just yeah. A so it's small it? now. It's WhatsApp, but uh, eventually, I think it will become a group. Yeah. Um, you know, we have to always consider safety because when we're going to meet in person there's always a safety implication i don't think you can say well let's just meet all let's just all meet here mm. you know there's there's um this uh, network is um dangerous and yeah. we have to be careful so there's certain safety measures in place for the for the group of course we never can expect that no one's looking in looking looking in yeah but um we have our ways to to, to stay safe Okay, so now maybe we can talk about this network. Yeah. Uh, in the time we have left. And with the intention of making people more aware of what's going on in the world and a bit more about, you know, the structure of power yeah. in the world. Yeah. And also I'd like to get your sense about are things changing now or do you mm -hmm. feel things are the same or do you feel th you, do you feel something's changing do you feel that their power is starting to slip away things like that well you said before that we couldn't maybe have had this interview that's five years ago absolutely right, right? so things are definitely changing and uh, that for me the change has been uh, so refreshing from 30 years ago mm. when mm, I couldn't even say that I had been sexually abused really well no I could but it was 
you know, the, the powers that be, especially in the media, and, you know, I would read so many articles in very well-established in, you know, magazines that I wanted to very much like, because I would, I, I was considered, I, I think I'm more left-leaning, because my perpetrators happen to be a lot of right-wing wing, uh, politicians, but they are definitely from both sides. There is no sides when we get up. It's like up versus down. You know, yeah. not left versus right. Yeah. yeah. So the, the American perpetrator gave me a good glimpse because he was a social engineer. He was not himself a politician, but he controlled politicians. Okay. He controlled one of the, uh, at least one of the presidents, probably more than one. Um, so social engineer, and maybe people don't quite know what exactly yeah, that Yeah, so means, this was so. someone from... One of the families, you, everyone would recognize their last name. Okay. Uh, you know, one of the very, you know, known philanthropic families. Um, so born into it. And social engineer is that he was working very hard. He was working behind the scenes mostly uh, to put out an agenda, a dark agenda that, um, you know, I don't know the history of it very well, but I'm sure it links, I mean, I've heard it links back to the Vatican, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it links back uh, over centuries. And that there is some sense that uh, you can be born into it or you can try to sort of grow into it and make your way to the top. And uh, that's part of the structure, that the more y you rise, the more you have to give up of your integrity and the more you are definitely going to be bought as, as you rise. So there is no way to rise to the top without uh, being completely compromised. And the higher you are, the more compromised you are. Right. Uh, so, that, so the difficulty is for beloved figures. You know, you, there's like, these political figures, very beloved. Mm. You have to start to think about, um, because they were not there by accident. Mm -hmm. and there is no real democracy. This is being engineered. So the idea that you have any choice when you're voting for two people anyway is just, to me, completely insane. But the idea that uh, you can make a difference with voting has been proven so many times to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And yet, there's been a very, so I've noticed uh, since the, the shooting in uh, Florida, the, the high school sh shooting in Florida, I've noticed a very strong um, push towards getting everybody to believe in voting again. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's been a lot of messages using children to put those messages out that you should vote. I see them from you time to time. You have your power now. through your vote. Yeah, yeah. That's been really prevalent. So, because the truth is that you make no difference whatsoever by voting, none. That's except not that, your power. Except that you're saying you're going along with the system yes. by voting. <laughs> you're right? going along with the system by voting. And the system has been set up. Um, it's not run, it's not a democracy. This is not a democracy. So if, you know, I, I heard a, a Hollywood um, mogul talk about uh, the democracy. Uh, it's not a democracy. Uh, it's, um, it's a satanic um, group of people who, I want to speak from personal experience, so my, my, my sense was that they, they felt entitled. Um, I've seen some strange things, but mostly I felt the, the, I felt what the arrogance was maybe the most prevalent uh, characteristic that all the people who were involved in this were extremely arrogant. And I think humility was like the one strong, the most, the st you know, if you don't have self-esteem, you can't be humble okay. because then you're going to feel humiliated. So if you don't have self-esteem, you need to prove. So yeah. I know that from experience. Yeah. So. Arrogance, again, is like a pointer that you have pain yeah. that hasn't been felt, that hasn't been resolved. 
So these people were the most arrogant, and they felt entitled both by blood, by the birth, and um, they worshipped Satan. They gave sacrifices to Satan. The children were sacrificed to Satan. So that's the thinking behind it. But I always, I think it's actually something else. I think there is this religion and the history and uh, the rituals and so forth. But I always felt what's really going on on a psychological level is that these people are killing a part of themselves and they mm. need to keep putting that into manifestation to feel that they can live. So there are these parts of this religion, is, is, it is, it's a belief, that um, involve working on longevity in your body, mm. staying here, mm. like, you know, like, this is it, I'm not while, going anywhere. While you're in power. While you, <laughs> <laughs> you've got power. So. Yeah, don't lose it. Don't hey, lose if I die, I'm going to have to be humble, you know, and I'll just be, be like one, of, the, one well, of everybody else. Well, if you have no concept of, of yourself, then you cannot believe that you can exist be after death. Mm. Your body is the uh, final uh, reality, even though you're working with, psychically, you're working with vibrations and energies and so forth, but not... Um, the awareness that after you die, you can also still exist as an entity, as, a, as yourself, as a consciousness in a different form. Um, so it comes, for me, the essence is fear. It's fear. It's all fear-based. Yeah. And it's the fear of a small child, again. I just see small children. So I was raped by about 200 men in that time, in those five years, and um, never an exception that the person who came there was a, a young boy who was asking me to give him the love that he didn't get. Rather, that was by being a mother by taking on the dirt or whether it was a mother by giving affection. Whatever they were asking me to do, it was always coming from a very young part and I always felt older than them. And you were probably a year or two older than who they were projecting out. Right? Well, I had probably had a little more love than them to be able to actually be emotionally a little bit older mm. than them. Yeah. Although I was, you know, probably in certain ways much older and in other ways much younger than my age. I obviously, many parts would not have really developed. Right. I find it, I have to say, I find it amazing in your story about how you, you make us understand the child and how prevalent childhood, childhood experience, then the nature of seeing things through a child's eyes is so prevalent in this power structure. Yes. It's like... It's Ignoring the child. <laughs> yeah, like... So ignore the child. That's weak, weakness. Ignore the weakness. And it infiltrates everything. I mean, the brainwashing system, so again, if we believe that people in authority can actually make a change, you know, it's naive to think that anyone, to look at the world today and to know what's going on, more or less, with all the war, that all the warfare that's going on that we do know about, and then all the warfare that we're not being told about, right. um, um, all the suffering that exists, people still dying of hunger yeah. for no reason at all. Yeah. Um, the earth being completely exploited to a point of you know, near extinction of the earth, like the earth is hurting. And um, this kind of greed that is at the bottom of this, the greed is like a toddler who wants their the toys, right? Who wants all the toys. Mm. It's not, not more than that. Not I mean, more than that. No. No. You're absolutely right. It's not more than that. 
Because even a 10-year-old would be wiser than that. Hmm. 10-year-old emotionally. <laughs> wow. Ten year, if we put 10-year-olds as leaders of the world, we'd be in better shape. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Who were emotionally their age. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Our leaders are emotionally infantile. But they're very smart. And that actually is trying to balance out for this lack, this, um, mm. you know, red psychopaths are very um, sick. And we've all been um, injected by that sickness. We've all been taught not to feel. Growing up is a lot about not feeling. And the sensitive people, you know, have a hard time, right, in the mm. world. And that's true. Absolutely. But... Um, it's actually not true, because the more you feel, um, the more you're in touch with everything. And so that actually brings great strength in the end. <laughs> yeah, no, sure. But, but, but as you say, the sensitive people are being told by everything they see and look at that, you know, they don't really fit. Right. Into this they're world. the losers. They're, not, they're losers. They're not, they're not moving up fast enough. Or Bill Gates will say, you, you, you don't work hard enough, you know. And you're going to be bad for our society because, you know, we need workers and we need it. Well, they need workers. That's what They I need mean. workers. I don't know how many hours a, a day we really need to work. <laughs> but that's another thing. That's like another we all go to work for, yeah. to feed this uh, hungry beast that is beast. the infantile, yeah. the infantile uh, little, little boy that, that can never be. It's emptiness inside. Yeah. And the emptiness is ignorance. That's ignorance of the self. Ignorance of the true nature of the self, which is not physical. So let's talk about what we're noticing mm -hmm. about this particular moment in history. Yes. In terms of Gladly. Um, things changing. Mm -hmm. Yes, I will tell you from, so Yogananda is my teacher, and his guru wrote a little essay about the yugas, which are... Um, eons of time. Yes, but they're not eons, actually. That's okay. the current um, uh, interpretation of the, Hindu, um, the Hindus is that it's very, very long. But he says that was actually a, a mistake from the Kali Yuga, from the Dark Ages. So he has um, a book called The Holy Science that's available from uh, Self-Realization Fellowship. It's a short book. It is a, a book a, about comparing scriptures and showing how the world, how the physical world comes into manifestation. So it take, may take a while to get to wrap your head around it mm -hmm. or to wrap your whole being around it. But the introduction to that little book, The Holy Science, is about the yugas being uh, 24,000 year cycles, with the shortest being the Dark Ages, a thousand years and based on the concept of this realm of duality where everything needs an opposite that our solar system also our sun also has a star and that is its opposite and there is a magnetic center in the universe that we either are drawing towards or moving away from right. whereas the opposite is um, going the other direction mm. so according to his calculations we would be having left the Kali Yuga, which was the Dark Ages, when man was not able to comprehend anything but matter. Um, and this has given rise to um, all the discoveries, this uh, electricity and so forth, and uh, 1700. And then those years... Uh, so in the spiritual sense, it is that we've entered this new age and that this new age is um, an age of higher awareness and an age where selfishness has no place. The matter-bound self is that little boy, you know, who has only his own body and nothing, nothing but the physical reality, whereas we, we know that that's not all there is. That there's so uh, to go back to the unity of humankind, that it's time to unite as human beings and to move out of this sort of uh, mastodont of an old 
power structure which is just trying to hold on and kind of kind of kind of gripping right now I think a lot of the shifts that we're seeing a lot of the uh, more and more is being revealed yeah more and more of the warfare is also being revealed and I think this is an, an a momentous time because if there is this this possibility not to fear monger but I think there is this possibility that if we don't wake up that things have to just get a lot worse that people will have to literally be smacked down to the ground and suffer great great losses to to get back to the essence of what life is all about yeah. and that if we just remain in this brainwashing and remain just ignorant of our privilege and ignorant of what it means to be privileged and how uh, we cannot use privilege and not connect to those below us and not um, you know reaching down is like service is like a the best thing to to just immediately do something immediately yeah yeah go and go into the jails and prisons and serve there and get over your prejudice i was you know, you know it, it's funny because when I heard that you were working in prisons, I, I just automatically got this idea of the pyramid, right? Yeah. And the power is supposedly up there where people are all reaching to, and you're reaching down here reaching down. to serve, and that's where the real power is, right? And that's where you can make such a big difference for people. That's where the real power is? Well, in the sense of the people are open people will yeah. be open to being connected yes. and they'll have the humility which is required you know the meek shall inherit the earth so that's what I mean by the real power absolutely. right absolutely um, and the real power you know gotcha. they, they, the, the feeling of, of going into prisons and seeing people there and I, almost for me saying you people we know you people shouldn't be in prison mm -hmm. you know of course we should be celebrating your lives and we should be taking all your experiences and mm -hmm. getting mm -hmm. some wisdom and insight from mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. and just flipping the whole thing around right. you know right with the reality of some of course people who are there because they have done things but again always coming from this place of trauma so that um, I'm not saying that certain people should shouldn't be part of society there are maybe ways to remove certain people or if somebody is um, a, pe a relentless pedophile, well, obviously he shouldn't be in society. Right. That doesn't mean he has to be in a dirty prison. Right. That it's just that to remove a person like that with the giving them a chance to heal also, mm. which, you know, this is a big debate, but, you know, that's why I wanted to go there because there's people who I know about the guilt and I know how hard it was for me to get back to a beginning of self-esteem after in this situation when I was a child. So just imagine that you do that in your adult life. Much harder to get back to your innocence. Yeah. But it's possible. Yeah. Um, it's difficult for psychopaths, but even for psychopaths it's possible. Do you get a feeling that, you know, despite you know, the, the trauma and the getting into psychopathy, that there is a part of us that's indestructible. It's there. It'll always be there, and it's a question of the person connecting with it, ultimately mm -hmm. seeing mm -hmm. it's there mm -hmm. somewhere inside. It is there for everyone. The light's in everyone. Yeah. Now, how far that's covered, uh, let's just say that someone like my mother, you know, I don't expect that she'll ever be able to contact her light. And many of the people that abused me I, it's not that I wouldn't wish it for them, right. but I don't expect it just because they've gone so far right. over the deep end. They've caused so much harm. At first you'd have to like roll all of that back. <laughs> well, but so if we take a bigger picture and say, you know, in, in the reincarnation of souls and coming back mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, having the capacity to deal with the trauma, ultimately mm -hmm. At some point, we're all going to come together as one, right? That's we our, are one. That's our journey. We already are one. Yeah. That's the thing, but we have to know it. You know, yeah. We have to learn to know that. So, I'm one with my perpetrators. <laughs> it's hard to say that. But that is a, a truth that, that is there that I'm reaching for. And energetically, 
So I think another thing, uh, another way in which we are not so helpless is to be able to use thought um, as a vibration, as an energy, um, to, you know, uh, I send light to the worst abusers. I, put, I visualize them in the light. I also visualize my group, the group of survivors that I work with. I visualize the children that are suffering today in, this, in all the networks, which are probably many, many, many children. So I do these visualizations of light. And I think that it's the next level, you know, that we, we, if we can change our thoughts, and if we can really uh, recognize that everyone has light in them, even if we can't see it, and if, even if they can't see it, even if they can never access it, that it's there, that may be a good place to start. And sending light, I mean, I couldn't for the longest time, I couldn't send light to my abusers. So I wasn't going to do it then, but I do it now. I send them light because I know that they need it more than anybody. And you see them as they are now? I, not quite. Not quite. No. Um, no, I'm not there. I still give them a little bit of power <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, closer. Yeah, but well, that's the healing journey, right? Yeah. And you've come a long way. I've come somewhere. <laughs> so I want to thank you so much for uh, speaking with me today and speaking to our audience today. And I think what you have to say is been of great value, is going to continue to be of great value, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I want to thank you for coming here and for um, being thorough and serious and uh, valuing my voice and my story. It's my pleasure. Okay, so that is the conclusion of probably what may be one of the most um, fascinating and intense and, and gripping sort of stories that has just so much in there to take away from it from a you know real life point of view but then also from a consciousness point of view where we begin to understand like wow how does someone that has gone through something so intense and so i guess you could say painful i mean really that's really what this what this is i mean what not to get into a comparative analysis but when you imagine um you know someone having to go through that at a young age, you know, having to uh, be a child sex slave, having to uh, be faced with almost being killed yourself, and then at the same time being asked to kill somebody. Um, it's really, really, really intense, and it's something that is very, very difficult to come back from, not to say that it's not possible. And this is why this was so important to us to share, because what we were showing here was that if you notice in Annika's testimony and her whole story here, she is not at a place of victimhood. She is not at a place of, you know, she's in fear or she's not at a place where she wants revenge. She's at a place where she understands and, and is able to share and has processed and has come to a state of peace with understanding the role that all of these things in her life has played and really what this place for humanity as a whole and how this cabal, these people, these elite that are in power are really empowered for a specific role and a specific reason and providing we take our power back, our, we don't give them so much anger, we don't give them so much you know, aggression and wanting revenge, we actually take the power away from them that they actually require, that fuels their existence to begin with. And when she shared that, that was like a moment. I remember I was almost in tears hearing it because for someone to be in a, the, having gone through the journey that she had gone through and yet still getting to that point, it opens up the door in a deep, 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 deep way for us all to recognize no matter what we've been through in our lives, we have the capability, we have the ability within ourselves to truly overcome the challenges and the, and the stuff that's there. And this leads so deeply into a lot of the conversations that are coming forward today, where we're learning about things that are happening in our world, some of the darker aspects of humanity. And in many ways, we want to stay in victimhood. But we know deep down that that's not going to lead us anywhere but continuing to have suffering, right? And Annika is an incredible am amount, in my opinion, of proof when we start looking at that. Her story is incredible. And the work she's doing now is she's taking what she's gone through and the journey of actually overcoming these traumas 
And she's teaching this to other people in prisons and and other people who have gone through this sort of stuff through her yoga practice and through her one-on-one work. And this is incredibly important because this is where we truly realize that change starts within. And when we change ourselves from within, from the inside, you'll notice that these feelings of aggression and revenge and wanting all this aggressive justice all the time and wanting people to burn and all these different things is coming from a state of consciousness, a state within ourselves that is actually fueling this system and is fueling the, 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 the world that we have out there that doesn't resonate with us on a deep level. So what we really need to do as we process this stuff, and again, the value of being able to go through a story like this, is to understand how powerful we truly are when we begin to process what it is that we feel, what it is that we go through, and when we move through these traumas to a point where we actually can get to a state of peace within ourselves. So once again, if 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 the the remainder of this story has brought anything up, has has challenged any aspect of ourselves or is bringing forth certain emotions, by all means, check out the meditation that we had in part two once again, because this is truly, truly how we're going to move through some of the challenging aspects of this story. this story here, it, we, we invite you to share it. You know, this is going to be available for anybody to share via email there because we really think that this story has the power to shift consciousness in a way that allows us to see what we are truly capable of and what is possible regardless of what it is that we go through. So I just want to say thanks again to Annika for allowing us to share her story and for sharing with, cur- with courage the depths of the story. Some of the stuff that she shared in this interview, she did not share anywhere else um, at, at, to the date that we, that we had actually filmed this. So thanks again for everybody as well for watching um, because this is truly something that's incredible to work through and incredible to pay attention to. And that's it. That's all. You know, we'll, we'll catch you in further uh, episodes that we have here on CETV.